Now, the latest from ITV News Meridian in the South. Good evening, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the South. Remembering Hungerford 30 years on, tributes to the 16 victims of Britain's first mass shooting and exclusive interviews with people who've never spoken before. I tried to use the gun again, click, 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 I heard three clicks and it was jammed and he just walked away. The face of a killer, the only photo of Michael Ryan, pictured with his former boss, who's spoken publicly for the first time today. He seemed a perfectly normal, uh, friendly, very polite, quiet sort of man. He seemed perfectly normal. Also tonight, in pride of place in Dorset, the Red Arrow sculpture in honour of pilot John Egging. Good evening. It was unthinkable. A man shooting people at random, killing them on the streets of a quiet market town in Berkshire. His mother, one of 16 victims. To the outside world, it became the Hungerford Massacre. To those in the town, it was a tragedy. And this weekend marks 30 years since it happened. Michael Ryan, a loner obsessed with guns, carried out the shootings on August the 19th, 1987. It began in the Savanac Forest in Wiltshire and ended in Hungerford, where he killed himself. Some victims knew him, others were complete strangers. In the first of our exclusive reports, Rachel Hepworth looks at how the community came together in the face of unbelievable tragedy. For 30 years, a simple plaque has commemorated the tragedy. It does bring it back, and some of them, as I say, I knew reasonably well. 16 names, but no mention of what happened. No explanation is needed. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, yes, I, I've... Ron Tarry was the town's uh, mayor and football club uh, chairman that, back in 1987. I had my car radio on and uh, I heard this thing, there'd been a shooting in Hungerford. And I thought, well, it's not my Hungerford, I like to call it that. Uh, and then it said, it's a small market town in, in Berkshire. And then I suddenly shot came me, this is it, it really is here. As the full horror emerged, Ron took a lead in speaking for a community having to deal with unprecedented scrutiny. Well, for some time after, if ever we went on holiday and people said, where do you come from? We said, well, we're near Newbury. Because if you said Hungerford, you couldn't help being involved in a long discussion about Michael Ryan. What did, did you know him? What was he like? What did he do? 30 years on, an entire generation lives here with no recollection of the day that Michael Ryan walked calmly through these streets, shooting dead 16 people and injuring 15 more before turning the gun on himself. Many of those who did live through it simply want to forget, but can't. It's part of the history of the town, uh, whether we like it or not. Trevor Wainwright was the town's bobby in 1987. Beautiful summer's day and Bedlam just broke out in the town. Trevor lost his father, Douglas, that day. His mother, Kath, survived after Ryan shot them both in their car. I think there was a lot of brave actions done that day by my colleagues and the police, ambulance service, you know, who put their lives on the line, uh, especially my colleague, Roger Brereton, who raced to the scene, and he was one of the first people killed. Ryan didn't know it, but the extent of his devastation was compounded because local police commanders were that day at a crime conference in Oxford and the Thames Valley Force helicopter was being serviced. There was no rule book to follow, such an event having never happened on British soil and communications on the ground were very basic. At the time of the shooting, I saw my first... I hadn't seen a mobile and I saw a mobile about like the size of a brick. Now, of course, communication probably would be much better, but it was certainly very difficult then. Six hours after the first killing, Ryan was finally cornered inside the John O'Gaunt School, where he shot himself in a classroom. Doing his best to minimise disruption was head teacher David Lee. Very much into the normal first day of term. From then One. until now, he's not spoken publicly. The guts that the woman who was going to teach there had 
was tremendous. And of children going into that classroom, once they walked in, life was normal. He and his good friend, local historian Jack Williams, believe the town largely healed itself. People didn't go around saying, let's avoid talking about it because it needed to be talked out and that way the poison came out, I suppose, and disappeared. We knew those that had severe problems and they were helped. And it wasn't counselling, inverted commas, modern term counselling, it was just caring people caring for people who needed care, and that's Hungerford. And the outside world responded too, raising hundreds of thousands for the victims' families. That sort of feeling is incredible. Somehow I get very emotional about things like this. Somehow that sort of feeling was because they felt they wanted to be helping. Helping was the word. Today, this quiet market town is getting on with life. The tragedy, a dim shadow, brought into focus on anniversaries. But even after three decades, those who were there still have questions. How do you possibly get your head round a man who kills his own mother and then sets fire to his house and kills his next door neighbours? That's the stark realism of the bloke. He was a very shy person, and if you didn't say hello to him, he wouldn't say hello to you. Sylvia Pascoe was a neighbour of the Ryan family and still lives in Southview. She can think of only one reason he killed his mother. I think that um, maybe it was the fact that um, he'd realised what he'd done and he didn't want her to live with the consequences. What really triggered it, I don't know, but I don't think any, there's anything that anyone could have done to anticipate what might happen and, and do something about it. No one to blame other than Ryan himself. Perhaps it would be different now in a culture of accountability, but it's been focusing on the positives and the future that has kept this town strong. Rachel Hepp with ITV News in Hungerford. Well, the killing spree in Hungerford began just after 12 o'clock. So what happened that day over nearly seven hours? And who was in Michael Ryan's path? It was a beautiful day here in the Savanac Forest and Susan Godfrey, who was 35 and from Reading, was enjoying a picnic with her two young children. Michael Ryan drove into the car park and forced her to put the children back into the car. He then walked her deep into the woods and shot her 13 times in the back. The two young children, who were just four and two at the time, were later found wandering in the forest by a neighbour. They told her, a man in black has shot our mummy. Michael Ryan, an unemployed labourer, had claimed the life of his first victim. As he drove east towards the market town of Hungerford, he was about to commit a series of appalling crimes that would make him one of the worst mass killers in history. Kakab Dean was the next person to be confronted by Ryan. He pulled into the Golden Arrow services a few miles down the road from the forest and started firing shots into her kiosk. They all missed. When he tried again, his gun jammed. He left and she immediately called 999. Michael Ryan then made his way back to his home here on Southview Road. He changed into his camouflage gear and set fire to the house. He was armed with several guns and fired at his neighbours, Sheila and Roland Mason, and both of them died. Ken Clements was out walking his dog with his family when he was confronted by Ryan. He held up his hands in surrender, but he was killed. PC Roger Brereton was the first police officer on the scene, and as he turned into Southview Road, Ryan opened fire. He radioed for help, but died in his patrol car. George White was the sixth victim. He'd offered to drive his friend Ivor Jackson home to his wife, who'd been shot and injured by Ryan. He fired at their car, killing Mr White and injuring Mr Jackson. Abdul Khan was mowing his front lawn when Ryan shot him dead. More passers-by were also injured, including the crew of an ambulance. It was then that Michael Ryan's mother, Dorothy, arrived back home 
to find her house on fire and her son armed with a gun. She pleaded with him to stop, but he didn't listen, and he shot and killed her too. Michael Ryan then made his way here to Hungerford Common on the outskirts of the town. Francis Butler was walking his dog, and he became Ryan's next victim. 30 years ago, police were rarely armed. There were no tasers, no CCTV, and very few people had a mobile phone. An incident like this had never happened before in Britain. Michael Ryan then walked on to Priory Avenue. The next innocent victim to die at his hands was Marcus Bernard. His murder was followed by that of Douglas Wainwright. Eric Vardy also drove into his path and died. It was now half past one. Michael Ryan was in Orchard Close. He fired at a passing car driven by his youngest victim, Sandra Hill. She was just 22. Victor and Myrtle Gibbs were also at home that day when Ryan burst in. Victor tried to shield his wife, who was in a wheelchair, but he died instantly. Mrs Gibbs died two days later. Ian Plail, who was 34, was his 16th victim. Ryan was firing indiscriminately at anyone in his path, and the police were unable to stop him. And this is where it ended, at Michael Ryan's former school, John O'Gaunt. He barricaded himself inside and police tried to reason with him. But at 6.52, they heard gunfire. He'd shot himself. Nobody knows why Michael Ryan did what he did. But his victims will always be remembered here in this quiet market town, which 30 years ago, in just one day, changed forever. So 16 people were killed that day, but many more could have died. One woman feels lucky to be alive, even now, because Ryan's gun, which he aimed right at her, failed to fire. If it had gone off, Kakob Dean would have been his second victim. Now, for the first time in 30 years, she's been talking to our reporter, Richard Slee. As soon as I just lift my eyes from the tail and I saw him carrying, you know, which looked like to me a machine gun, and he would just point you straight at my head here. And he took a shot from there. This is Cockup Dean speaking to ITV News shortly after the Hungerford shootings. Then he came into the shop. So traumatising were the events that day that Cockup never again spoke publicly about what happened to her. Until now. It horrifies me. She told me that after that first shot, Michael Ryan came looking for her. I tried to use the gun again, click, 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 I heard three clicks. And it was jammed and he just uh, walked away, went in his car. And at this and point you were hiding behind the counter? I was hiding behind the counter. What did you think when you heard those clicks? Oh, my God. Robbery. It can't be robbery because we know him. There were so many things was going on. Just to think, oh, my children don't come in the, in the shop. That was the most worrying point for me. Cockup assumes that Michael Ryan thought he'd already killed her and so got back in his car and drove off to Hungerford. How soon after he went away did you realise that actually what had happened to you was part of something much more devastating? When I called the police, they came over and then they got a message saying, there's a house on fire, so go and look there, and somebody is dressed up as a Rambo. And they just left me there and went to Hungerford. This photograph was taken just after that happened. Cockup says she feels lucky to be alive. She had two more children after 1987, but that day did have a devastating impact on her character. I wasn't sure who to trust, who not to trust. I couldn't work, and since then I haven't worked. I'm unable to work. And even though if I, if I go into the shop and there is a bang, I scream, which I didn't know before that I was doing that. That was the day I went with my friend. And when she heard this scream, she said, Cockup, did you know? You screamed? I said, no, I didn't. 
Her life since 1987 may have been difficult, but Cockup knows that for the families of those who died, it's been much worse. Richard Slee, ITV News. We'll be returning to Hungerford in a moment. But first, more of the day's news. A teenager's been killed in a car crash in West Sussex. He was a passenger in a car which left the road near Five Oaks and overturned. Another passenger was badly hurt and the driver was arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. A man has been charged in connection with a disturbance at a block of flats in Bournemouth yesterday. Emergency services were called to Gillam Road where a man was reported to be setting fire to items in the garden. A 42-year-old is accused of using threatening behaviour. A sculpture in memory of Red Arrows pilot John Egging, who was killed when his plane crashed at Bournemouth Air Show six years ago, has been relocated. It had to be moved following a landslip. His widow was at today's ceremony to mark the occasion. John was a very positive person. He always believed, as pilots do, that even if there's the greyest of skies, if you reach high enough, you go through the cloud, there'll always be blue skies. And John was a person who helped young people to see that as well. Whatever challenges they had in their lives, they could be overcome and there could be a brighter future. Critically ill children treated in intensive care at Southampton's Children's Hospital have a better chance of surviving than anywhere else in the country. That's according to the latest findings of the Paediatric Intensive Care Audit. The unit treats youngsters from right across the south. That's good news and so is this. West Sussex is the best place in England for people to retire. An insurance company report says it offers the best quality of life with good health care, low crime levels and kind weather. In sport, all of our football teams are in action this weekend. In the Premier League, Southampton hosts West Ham after the Gow family paid £210 million to buy 80% of the club. And Saints have said that Virgil van Dijk is not for sale. Ralph was clear, Les was clear. And, and hopefully I got the same idea that to progress as a team, as a club, we had to keep our best player. Brighton travel to Leicester after Shane Duffy, Anthony Knockhart and Lewis Dunk all signed new extended contracts. All three have thoroughly enjoyed their time here and done very, very well for us. And um, I think it's just testament of where we're trying to go in this one. But de really delighted with all three. And Bournemouth hosts Watford in their first home match of the season with manager Eddie Howe looking to buy at least one new player. The pool of players I have to pick from is very, very strong. Um, but we don't have the huge depth, so that's, that's obviously my issue um, if we get uh, any more injuries. For more of the day's news and sport, head to our website, you know the address, or get in touch with us. You can always give us a ring or get in touch via Facebook or Twitter. Let's return to our top story now and tomorrow it's the 30th anniversary of the Hungerford tragedy. 16 people were shot dead by Michael Ryan in the quiet market town. There will be a church service on Sunday to remember the victims and their families. Well, after Hungerford, there were questions as to how Ryan had been able to build up such a collection of firearms. He had a licence to own guns. Within a year, Britain's gun laws had changed, but there's still fierce debate as to whether they're tough enough. Here's Martin Douse. Hungerford was this country's first mass shooting. In its wake, the type of semi-automatic rifles Michael Ryan had used to kill were effectively banned. But many felt the government at the time had not gone far enough. It took public and political revulsion at the massacre of 16 schoolchildren in Dunblane nearly a decade later and the banning of most handguns to give the UK the toughest gun control laws in the EU. But even then, the new laws were amendments to existing legislation from the 60s, littered with exceptions. Many anti-gun campaigners say new, tighter, more specific laws are needed. We've often said we have the t amongst the toughest gun laws in the world, but, but often it's a, it's a case of information slippage between those agencies, health agencies, policing agencies, that, that allow people who really ought not to be owning a gun to, to keep them. I, I think this is an area we have tight laws but it's all about the implementation of those laws and I think we still have some way to go on that one. 
I think you know, the, the laws are pretty tight now, actually, and there's a great deal of checks and balances and ongoing monitoring by the police about you know, firearms and, uh, and shotgun certificate holders. And I think the shooting community is much more alert to uh, activities that are inappropriate, and I think the safety record, the exemplary safety record that the shooting community has exercised is evidence of that. Background checks, police interviews and medical reports are all required to hold a firearm licence for sporting or professional reasons today and it's reviewed every five years. But critics point out that all of this country's notorious mass shootings involve perpetrators like Michael Ryan who legitimately owned the guns they killed with. Martin Dowse, ITV News. Well, no one knows why Michael Ryan did what he did, not the real motive. It's been suggested he was suffering from schizophrenia or psychosis, but did he really mean to kill his mother, who he was so close to? We do know he was severely affected by the death of his father, Alfred, from cancer two years before his killing spree. But his crime does defy explanation. Well, just one picture of him exists. He's standing next to the entrepreneur Peter de Savary, who employed him at his country estate Littlecote House. He's not spoken publicly about what happened until now. Over to Mr de Savary in Guildford. Very few people seem to know Michael Ryan at all. How much did you know about him? Well, Michael worked for me at uh, Littlecut in uh, Hungerford. And um, I wouldn't say I knew him well, but he was one of my employees. I, I certainly spoke to him on many occasions. Um, so uh, for the period he worked for us, which was for a few months, um, I did know him. What was he like? Well, he seemed a perfectly normal, uh, friendly, very polite, uh, quiet sort of man. Uh, certainly nothing struck me odd about him at all. He seemed perfectly normal. Obviously, uh, I was very wrong. There was something lurking in him which was uh, both evil and abnormal and terrible. Um, but there were no signs of that when he worked, uh, when he worked for me. He was, uh, uh, he was a perfectly normal person, particularly uh, quiet, uh, but very polite, and um, certainly gave no indication of, uh, of any uh, unattractive uh, aspects to his personality. What was your reaction when you heard what had happened and that he'd, be, he'd been responsible? Well, I was actually up on holiday in Scotland when I heard the news and uh, it was with some degree of disbelief, obviously. Uh, you know, it was a, a dreadful tragedy uh, for all those that were involved in it. I was shocked uh, uh, that his personality had changed so dramatically. You were, of course, photographed with him in the only existing picture, I think, of him. Do you remember that photo being taken? I, uh, I think it's a, a, dreadful, a dreadful thing to in any way be photographed with this uh, evil man. But um, uh, there we are at the time of the photograph. Uh, he was a perfectly, apparently normal person. Um, but how wrong was I? 30 years on, how do you think of the way in which the people of Hungerford have recovered from this tragedy? I think the community as a whole has been very vibrant and uh, has recovered and, and tried, uh, I think, successfully uh, to keep Hungerford as a very attractive place for the tourists who come, the people who live there and work there. And I think they've been amazing in, uh, in their stalwartness uh, and their reaction to this terrible thing. Peter de Savary, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And there's more from Peter de Savary on our website. Just go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Now, the weekend starts here, so let's find out what the weather's going to be like with Ashling Creevy. It's looking sunny out there. P&O Dover Calais Ferries sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Hello there. We still have some showers to come over the next few hours. Some of those showers still giving a few rumbles of thunder, quite heavy in a few spots. But they're pushing on through fairly quickly and through the rest of tonight, they will eventually fade away and push off to the east. Now, this is how it looks by the end of the night. Temperatures will fall to around 12 Celsius, a mild start to Saturday morning, a breezy one as well. Now, plenty of sunshine around during the morning, but into the afternoon, we'll see a little bit more cloud bubbling up. That cloud may help just trigger one or two showers, a breezy afternoon as well. 
but temperatures should climb to around 20 Celsius. It'll feel really warm and pleasant in the sunshine and that UV index is still as high as 6. Now if we fast forward into Sunday, Sunday starts off on a bright note, some good spells of sunshine around but as we head into the afternoon we'll see some clouds just very slowly starting to feed in from the southwest and it may become thick enough just to give one or two spots of rain into the afternoon but I think it'll feel much warmer than these numbers suggest, the humidity starts to climb and we'll see highs of around 20 Celsius. Now as we head into the early part of next week we just about hang on to that warm and tropical moisture that's been caught up in that ex-tropical storm Gert and as we head into next week we hang on to that for a few days so a few, a few warm days in store and then we see high pressure just very slowly trying to build in and hopefully it'll bring us a few fine and settled days of weather and hopefully a few dry days as well. So a quick recap on Saturday, lots of sunshine around, maybe one or two showers, particularly further west. On Sunday, increasing amounts of cloud, but still warm highs of 21 and a few showers on Monday. p and Dover Calais Ferries, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Now in just a moment, the ITV Evening News with Alistair Stewart. But from all of us, thank you for watching. On the day, we remembered the 16 victims of Hungerford and the 15 others injured in a shooting that shattered the peace of a quiet market town on one day 30 years ago. Good night. Good night.